This is the first part of a four-part video lecture on the subject of accent formation and foreign language learning. And in this first segment, I am going to be discussing the, some of the basic principles of phonetics, in particular as these relate to the ways in which uh, the sound imprinting and speech habit formation of our native mother languages affect our ability to uh, learn foreign languages uh, as adults and, and uh, reproduce their sounds with fidelity. Um, in the second video, I will discuss some of the uh, resources and techniques that are available to us as learners uh, as we nonetheless attempt to acquire um, some uh, r the best accents of which we are capable. And in the third video, I will analyze some specific examples of accents in foreign languages in terms of both the uh, techniques and methods that were used to acquire them and the overall effort that was put into them. And in the fourth and final video, I will discuss the desirability of keeping a realistic perspective of what can be attained in, in this whole regard. So. This is a chart showing the International Phonetic Alphabet, which, as the title says, is an alphabet, a graphic system, that attempts to use a phonetic representation, that is one sound uh, and one graphic representation, one, one letter, um, for internationally, for all languages. So um, this is the idea is that you can write the sounds of every single human language using this alphabet and each letter that you see will represent one and the same sound in all languages. Even if you haven't studied phonetics before, even if the only language you know is English, uh, because English is not a phonetic alphabet, whenever you've looked up a, a word in, in a good English-English dictionary, next to the correct spelling and before the definition, you'll see in brackets um, another spelling of the word, and perhaps you've always just glossed over it, but uh, you might recognize, even from that, some letters and characters such as this, for which we do have these sounds or phonemes in English, but we don't have a single graphic representation for them. We uh, can English is not a phonetic alphabet, and we can write the same sound in many different ways. So uh, there are a number of charts on this entire chart of the International Phonetic Alphabet. This top one here, the main one, shows consonants, and this other main important one over here shows vowels. Um, the difference between consonants and vowels, consonants are sounds that are made by moving your mouth and touching some of what we call your speech organs, your tongue and your, uh, your lips and your teeth and various parts of your mouth, whereas vowels are sounds that are made um, not by touching anything, not by moving anything, but rather by putting your mouth into one set position and just pushing the air out. Let's look at consonants first. Consonants are described, uh, you see they're here they're in boxes that correspond to various rows going across and columns going down. The columns show the uh, place of articulation, the where you make the sound, and the, uh, the rows show the manner of articulation, the kind of sound that it is. So the first row going across is known as the plosive sounds, or stops. These are sounds that are made like p, b, t, d, k, g. These are sounds that are made by <coughs> stopping the flow of air altogether, that's why they're called stops, and then letting it out explosively in a plosive fashion, why they're called plosives. Nasal sounds is the next uh, row going across. These are nasal sounds, sounds that come out of your nose. Sounds like mmm, mmm, mmm. These are nasal sounds. Um, this column here that is fully represented in every box, these are the fricatives. Fricatives are sounds like f, v, s, these are sounds that you make not by uh, stopping the flow of air altogether, uh, but by occluding it, by blocking it and forcing it to come out of a, a smaller hole in the center of your mouth or the two smaller holes on, on the side of your mouth. So these are the manners of articulation and the places of articulation. This corresponds to the front of your mouth on the left and going back to your throat uh, on, on the right. So the first 
place of articulation. These are bilabial sounds, sounds that you make uh, by pushing your two lips together. Then you get labiodental, touching your teeth to your lips. Dental sounds, touching your tongue to your teeth. Alveolar is a very important uh, type of sound. Uh, not a familiar word. The alveolar, the alveolar ridge is that little uh, raised bump right behind your top teeth at the front top of your mouth. Postalveolar is a little behind that. Retroflex is the very top center of your mouth. Palatal is uh, the back of your mouth where you still have that hard, hard palate. Velar is uh, where that soft flap is. And then going further back deeper into your throat is uvular, pharyngeal, and glottal sounds. <clears throat> so we describe consonants like that as being, for example, bilabial plosives. But you look here and you see you have two letters uh, in bilabial plosives. They're familiar letters to us. Um, but let's not think of, oh, well, P is a bilabial plosive, but rather that we represent a bilabial plosive, uh, we can represent it by a P or a B. What's the difference? Uh, as phonemes, um, if you can read here, it says where symbols appear in pairs, the one to the right represents a voiced consonant. So let's try that. A bilabial sound is a sound that you make by pushing your two lips together, and a plosive is a sound that you make by stopping the sound and letting it come out. So put your hand, put one hand flat on your throat, and do that. You can make a sound like p, and you can make a sound like b, p, b, p. B. They're both bilabial plosives, but when you make the p sound, well, of course you feel your throat moving a little bit. You're alive. You're pushing air out of it. But it's nothing compared to the uh, deeper vibrations that you get when you make the b, b. The whole throat rumbles. So the ones on the right are called voiced consonants, and the ones on the left, if there are two in a box, are called um, devoiced or non-voiced consonants. And that's the way we describe uh, consonants together as by place and manner of articulation also with voicing. So a bilabial voiced plosive is represented by a familiar looking B, whereas a bilabial devoiced plosive is represented by a T. Alveolar sounds, again, you touch your tongue to the alveolar ridge and you make a sound. If you block the sound altogether and then let it out uh, with uh, keep your hand on your throat and have your throat not rumble too much, you'll get something like a T, T. But if you let your throat or make your throat rumble and you touch your tongue to your alveolar ridge and you make a plosive sound, you'll get a d, d, d. So that's the way that the uh, consonant chart works. And uh, the vowel chart works in a somewhat similar fashion in that if you can read this, this is the front of your mouth and this is the back of your mouth, central or midpoint. And up here you have, uh, this says, here it says open and close, and it's often represented as a uh, high and low. Um, and then we get open mid, close mid, points in your mouth. Um, so you see here, this is a close front vowel or a high front vowel. Um, this means that, again, for vowels you don't... Uh, you don't move anything once you set your mouth into position. If you can imagine the focal point or the energy or the resonance from which the sound is coming as you make the sound and push it out of your mouth, we were just talking about the alveolar ridge and bilabial sounds. Go back up there into the front top of your mouth, okay, and close your mouth for the most part. Don't have it wide open <clears throat> and make a sound. It's going to be e, 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 e as a high front vowel or a closed front vowel. Um, you can do the same thing if you make your lips uh, more rounded. You can go like the uh, consonants that come in pairs. A lot of the vowels come in pairs, and the one on the right represents a rounded vowel when you make it with your lips more rounded. Um, Always in the front of your mouth, we have, if I make sound continuously and get a continuum of sound, I'll be going over various uh, diphthongs, but if I stop at various points that are designated, as say close or close mid, open mid, or open, I'll get as front vowels basically e, 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 a, whereas as back vowels, I will have uh, feeling the sound resonating, coming from, emanating from the top back of my mouth with my mouth relatively closed. It's going to be u, o, Oh, oh, back vowels. Um.
Um, so these are the uh, basic charts of consonants and vowels that are used in the International Phonetic Alphabet. There are some other charts uh, for different kinds of consonants, other symbols uh, for supersegmentals, for diacritics that uh, designate uh, various sounds more specifically as breathy or, or creaky, and for tones and word accents, for tonal languages that uh, show the place where it's a high tone or a low tone rising or falling. And so um, if you look at the entire chart of the International Phonetic Alphabet, which again represents all the sounds uh, that are uh, in, in human languages, you'll find about uh, 200 different sounds, or phonemes, that is, sounds that are taken and put into human languages, employed uh, to create words and therefore to convey meaning. Um, there are about 200, let's say, is a, is a nice round number, um, but uh, in any given language, you're never going to find that many. Um, let's look at this, go back to the consonant chart and see, well, in the first place, let's look, there are some uh, places that are blank and some that are well, blanked out. The shaded areas denote articulations judged impossible. Uh, the phoneticians think it's physically impossible to make a velar uh, trill or tap or flap. Uh, you can try it, and if you can do it, let them know. Maybe they'll unshade the box, and then it'll be blank, because I think that the blank boxes are sounds that are physically possible to make, but have not been documented in uh, in any human language. And let's remember that we don't know how many uh, human languages there are. It's generally thought to be in the high thousands, so 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, perhaps 10,000 languages, but uh, only uh, 10% of those at most, a very small percentage, have been documented, rep represented, written down in any way, shape, or form. So the letters that you see here represent phonemes that have actually been found employed in human languages, um, and uh, the others are, are possibilities that uh, are there too. So let's say that there are about 200 possible sounds that are generally employed in human languages. Some of the sounds are a lot more common. You can find them in almost every language, and some of the sounds are relatively rare. Not too many languages use them. Um, some languages use uh, relatively few sounds uh, can be described as phonetically simple languages that only have in their entire phonetic inventory about 15 or 20 sounds. Um, your average, typical, standard, run-of-the-mill uh, language probably uses in the area of 30 or 40 phonemes in its phonetic inventory to, to make the sounds of its, uh, of its words. Uh, and on the high end, there are some languages that we can describe as phonetically complex that may use 50 or even uh, 60 different sounds. But even those languages, uh, obviously, if there are 200 total phonemes and you use 50 or 60, you're only using 25 or 30 percent of the uh, total sounds that are available uh, to be used in human languages. And that uh, brings us to the more important part of this, uh, this lecture, is the way that our native language uh, influences our foreign language acquisition. And uh, that happens in the following fashion. There are all these possible sounds that you could use and employ in a human language. Now, languages don't take uh, just randomly uh, any old sound and put them together. They're sort of balanced out through various parts of the phonetic chart. Um, but they have some sounds, and they don't have most sounds. Now, um, the English philosopher John Locke uh, is famous for talking about a blank slate with which the human mind is born and then it's written on by life's experience. And I think that that uh, can be and has been challenged in uh, some respects by genetics and uh, even by psychology, Jungian psychology, notions of a collective unconscious and other things influencing us besides pure experience. But when it comes to language acquisition and sounds, I, I think it's perfectly true that uh, any baby uh, that's born into any linguistic environment uh, or even any child that grows up in it is capable of making any of these sounds. But because the sounds are not all used in any language, uh, over time, as the child grows up, uh, the child gets used to hearing certain sounds, and not just hearing them, but reproducing them, making them just the way the adults uh, around him or her make them. But 
by force of not hearing the other sounds, uh, we actually lose the ability to perceive them as distinct sounds. So if your language doesn't have these sounds, you'll never hear them, you won't grow up with them, and then as an adult you will encounter them, you probably at first will just uh, hear them uh, not as sounds as such, but rather as noise. Uh, and then you need to learn to speak a language correctly. You need to learn how to, to make that sound. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, that, that window of opportunity for doing that. Some people who, um, researchers in early childhood language uh, acquisition, insist that that window of opportunity is, is very small, very slender, that it's uh, 24 months or even 12 months, the first year of life you need to hear sounds uh, in order to get them right. Now, uh, on the one hand, um, if, you're, if you are a parent, you have young children, and you'd like to uh, give them an edge in learning foreign languages later on in life, um, you need to somehow take advantage of that. And let me tell you about a, a product or a method that I found for uh, doing that belatedly for my sons. But if I have another child, I'll certainly uh, play them in the background. I think we're all familiar with the concept of the, uh, the Mozart effect of uh, supposedly playing nice Baroque music that I personally would want to listen to anyway, but playing it in the background, helping the uh, developmental intelligence of children. Um, a, 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 a place called uh, Baby Safari. Baby Safari has taken this to the nth degree with language acquisition in particular and produced a, a whole set of uh, sounds, uh, basic sound patterns in something like 25 different languages that you can play, like the, the Mozart effect. Uh, they're spoken nicely in subdued fashions and with music. Uh, and in this fashion, children can grow up uh, even uh, not hearing the, the full spoken language, but hearing a, a larger phonetic inventory around them. Um, I personally think that, though, that 12-month that, that figure certainly is, is much too low. I, there, there is a limit to it, but I think it's 12 years, not 12 months. I've known uh, so many people, too many people, who uh, have moved from one native language to another one, to another linguistic environment as young children, and uh, have acquired it and uh, sound absolutely as if they'd, they'd always been speaking it, as if their parents had also spoken it. Whereas I've also known lots of people who uh, move to a new linguistic environment uh, as adolescents, as slightly after the age of puberty. And although these people uh, tend to have uh, perfectly accurate grammar uh, through force of their education and a vocabulary that may be just as rich uh, as, a, as a native speaker's, still there's always a tinge, there's something uh, in their speech, a different sound pattern, a different lilt that shows that they uh, did not hear the sounds now that they're using all the time. They didn't hear these when they were uh, young enough. And that affects us in, uh, I think, two specifically different ways. Um, the fact that we don't hear certain sounds when we're growing up, and then when we learn foreign languages, uh, we need to first and foremost perceive them. And that can be a very difficult thing. Let's go to this um, column, the retroflex column, uh, which is uh, not represented in European languages for the most part, but is uh, extraordinarily important in Indic languages. Um, so if you're a native speaker of English uh, and you want to learn a language like Hindi, um, you might uh, need to be told that there are two different basic, you see them, here's a T, here's a T with a tail, there are two basic different T sounds. There is something in Hindi that's like a T, T, but there's also another way of making that same basic sound, or it sounds like that to you, by curling your tongue further back and touching it to the roof of your mouth and going, ka, ka, ka. And you may have a very hard time hearing those apart, um, perceiving them in the first place. That's the first challenge that you have to overcome. Um, but then another thing about speech habits uh, is that they are physical habits and you have a hard time uh, making your tongue move. There are lots of little tiny muscles there. Move and do different things after 20 years or more of not making certain motions. Getting your tongue to move in a certain fashion can be quite difficult. So the first hurdle in uh, acquiring an utterly new sound that you didn't grow up with is hearing it, perceiving it in the first place. Uh, you might be physically incapable of it. You might be in effect deaf to it and you need to learn to perceive it. <clears throat> and then you need to learn to make the physical uh, physical gestures that will produce it. <clears throat> That's one part of the hard part.
but um, even with uh, more familiar languages than uh, another exotic type branch language, you'll find that other sounds, such as these alveolar uh, plosives, the basic t, d sounds, these are very common uh, sounds. I think these are phonemes that are found in probably every single language, but um, they're slightly different. This is not a concrete fixed place. It's possible to um, make uh, an alveolar voiced or devoiced plosive sound by touching various parts of the front of your tongue to uh, various parts of your alveolar ridge. You can press it flatter and towards the front, or you can uh, point it more uh, the, the tip of your tongue in a, in a sharper fashion and touch higher up, further back on the alveolar ridge. Um, and you'll get this um, uh, in uh, words, uh, related languages, or languages that have the same vocabulary. Let's take uh, an example. We have the word total. Okay, we have the word total in English. Uh, we have that exact same word, exact same spelling, basic pronunciation in lots of other languages that are commonly studied, such as uh, French or Spanish. But uh, the French total, uh, the T's in there, are going to be pronounced with what I just said, with the tongue pulled much uh, higher up towards the top back of your alveolar and pointed uh, total, total, total. Uh, but the Spanish total is going to be uh, with the, uh, the uh, tongue pressed flatter and pushed more towards the front of the alveolar ridge. Total, total, total. So we have total, total, total. Uh, different ways of saying that same basic T sound, and I probably betrayed my American accent and um, both of those that I just used, uh, but that's the other hard part is that if your tongue is used to going to a specific place to make a specific sound and you ask it to go to a slightly different place on a regular basis, that can also be uh, quite difficult to do. So these are some of the uh, basic uh, phonetic problems that we face and have to overcome in order to uh, learn how to speak foreign languages, make the sounds of foreign languages. Um, but everything that I've been talking about until now and everything that you're looking at, I think that this is only half of the picture in, um, in, in making the sounds of a language. Uh, these, to use an analogy to music, these are the specific notes. These are the specific notes that can be played, but when you put them all together to play music, you get another aspect of languages uh, that can't be captured in a chart and put down, and that is their musicality or resonance. And I think perhaps I can best illustrate that by switching to a number of different dialects of, of English to my best uh, imitation right now of a southern accent, the way I've always heard my relatives from Nashville, Tennessee talk. Uh, I'm still speaking English. I have not changed anything in my basic phonetic inventory, but I have utterly changed the musicality and the, the pronunciation of the sounds that I'm doing. Um, I think I can also do a relatively decent imitation of RP, received pronunciation, the standard British pronunciation is over and against my uh, normal variant of GA, General American. And again, I haven't done anything conscious to change my pronunciation of any of the phonemes that I'm producing, but rather, as almost with the, the pure vocalic production, I've shifted the base of articulation, I've shifted the main focal point of where I am speaking. When I speak with my normal voice, my uh, overall effort, the overall energy of sound coming out of my mouth is uh, kind of up uh, to the back top, uh, so maybe in this basic area, whereas when I speak with a southern accent, I tend to swallow my voice a bit more, and I'm speaking much more from the back uh, bottom part of my throat. And uh, when I put on my British accent, I shift forward. I push the sound much more up close to the front of my mouth and, uh, and my lips. And I think it's true that the phonetic inventory of the different dialects of English, uh, might, there might be one phoneme here or there, more or less, but uh, it's basically the same. Uh, and so the change in sound is utterly produced by shifting the basic resonance. And so this is also something that's uh, extraordinarily difficult for some people to do, to um, you get used to having the, the main point of energy in your mouth be uh, in a certain place. And to shift, to find it uh, for another language or another dialect, it was one thing, another language altogether, um, 
this calls into play an enormous degree of what we can think of as, as, as a vocal posture, the way that all of your muscles are interconnected and relate to each other and uh, produce the sounds uh, is fundamentally changed when you uh, need to use a different overall basis of articulation. And uh, just that's the nature of life. We seem to be like um, uh, uh, read-only discs that you can... Uh, but you, you can you can program one fashion, they're blank, but then when you try to reprogram it, they're always going to sort of uh, echo with what was underneath there or down there before. So um, that's my basic uh, phonetic overview of the way that, well, uh, phonetics works and the way in particular that uh, our native languages affect the way that uh, we're able to learn to speak other foreign languages and adults. And as I said at the beginning of this video and the next one, I will discuss some of the resources and techniques that are available to us nonetheless as we try to learn foreign languages with the best accents of, of which we are capable.